Good morning, um, or afternoon. I love seeing a few people here. I do have to actually just apologize to some of the people that were mentioned earlier on. Uh, sometimes you have to apologize for what other people say. Um, I think uh, Norman called your babies Corona babies. I am so sorry uh, on behalf of the church, um, but maybe you didn't take any offense. Uh, you shouldn't have, uh, but Corona Babies, I think we'll come up with a different name. Uh, but yes, that will be memorable uh, <laughs> in the future. I've actually really loved seeing some of the stuff that has been happening in the time that we, uh, we've experienced this uh, pandemic thing and the effects of it. I've seen many opportunities and people taking the opportunities to bless others through this. Um, I get a little glimpse into the youth group by being in their group chat. Please don't uh, take me off of that chat. Uh, it has many times encouraged me. Um, but the leaders of the youth are blessing the youth and helping them to, um, to look to God in this time. And I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. I've seen others uh, donate to the food drive. I just got pictures right before this recording from the mission committee and the deacons who went and they... Uh, brought those food baskets out to the various villages around Spanish Lookout. Uh, and then also just seeing some of the scripture that's being shared, some of the messages that you guys are, are giving each other. Uh, it, it blesses me and it blesses uh, the people of God. And this has given us great opportunity to bless the people around us. Let's not stop that. Another thing that I've noticed in the last week uh, is how relevant the Bible is to our context. And I'm not even just talking about Job. I'm also talking about the reading plan that we have been going through. Uh, the prophets. Shucks, they are relevant right now. Um, I, I looked a little bit at uh, Habakkuk. Yikes, that's a relevant book to what we are experiencing right now. At the end of the service, I do want to share a little bit of Habakkuk, a few verses from there uh, with you all as an encouragement. Uh, Nahum. Uh, a, a, a time when there was um, a, lot of, a lot of different things that, that people were struggling with, similar to what we struggle with now. Zephaniah, also uh, a book uh, that, that, that talks a lot about suffering, a lot about the suffering of the people, um, and also the suffering that was coming at the hands of, uh, of the Babylonians. One of the things, though, in these passages, in these books, that comes up over and over and over, they've been on repeat for the last few weeks in the reading plan, is that there is transformation through suffering. That is one of those messages that comes through absolutely clear in the prophets. That God is working to transform, even in the midst of our suffering. We're going to talk a lot about that this morning. Mel and I talked this week about how almost overnight life can get crazy. Uh, I remember early on in the days of the coronavirus, it seems like a long time ago, uh, we were shocked at how very quickly things changed, right? We would make plans and, uh, and then almost an hour later those plans would change. One day we were shopping normally Next day, we were standing in a very long line at FTC, <laughs> outside. Um, one day, we were meeting people and shaking hands, and the next day, we were kind of like, mm, I'm not supposed to touch you. <laughs> it, was, it was a shock. And uh, it was kind of wild how that can change overnight. Some of you probably have... Uh, other things that changed overnight. Some lost their jobs. Some went, uh, they, they lost the ability to make an income. I think of especially uh, the, some of the cattle farmers and, and all of that. It's, it's, it, it's becoming very hard. And so these changes are extreme. And it's crazy that it happened overnight or somewhat overnight. And it's earth shattering for so many people. Many of you, actually, this isn't the first time those types of things have happened to you. You've experienced shakeups like this in the past. 
Some of you have lost a loved one. And it's almost overnight, life is completely different. And you wonder if there will ever be uh, a normal day again. (laughs) And it happened almost overnight. One day you got up, went about your daily business. The next day, you wonder if you maybe even can get up at all. There was a character in the Bible who experienced that type of day. A day where he woke up, just like any other day, and then began to get news that life as he knew it was over. (laughs) Life as he knew it was infinitely different than he imagined it just yesterday, right? Completely the opposite of what he expected. We started last week with a series on the book of Acts, and we learned that we shouldn't be so focused on the destination of heaven or our own timeline, that we miss our purpose here in the present. This was very real to the disciples, and it was was this that helped them launch into God's plan and God's mission that was going to be brought about through them. Some of you were thinking last week, like our character this week though, how can there be purpose in what I'm experiencing today? Many are going through difficult stuff, loss of a job, loss of health, loneliness, and you're wondering what's going on. You have tons of questions about this. We're going to step away from Acts this week and continue our big picture of the Bible series. And we're going to look at that extreme circumstance when life changes overnight. And we're going to look at some extreme questions that Job asks. And many of those questions we actually have today as well. And people have had for all of history. These questions that we're asking right now are not just questions that we've asked. To me, that's a little bit of a comfort. That I'm actually not alone in this. And that uh, in the Minor Prophets, we we saw uh, these are questions that the Israelites asked. These are questions that you have asked. These are questions that they asked Uh, Abraham asked. These are questions that people have asked throughout the generations. And we have a book that that helps us through some of those questions. So, uh, last week, I wanted you to think about the purpose in the present. Now I want to ask that you think about the difficulties in the present as well. Job is a book that's a little mysterious. It reads a little bit like a story at the start. But really, most scholars would say that this book is a part of the wisdom literature. Isn't that interesting? This is wisdom literature, which means it is a part of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It's a similar book to that. But what the book does is it's meant to give us understanding and wisdom in life's very real difficulties. Some scholars are also led to believe that it is not historical. Some, though, are led to believe that it is historical. It's mysterious. Some believe that it's the oldest book in the Bible, perhaps even written by Moses. Others believe it was written in the 6th century BC. That's very different. It's a bit of a mystery, this book. I would argue that whatever your answer to those questions are, they really don't end up making a whole lot of difference. This book has great wisdom for us. It was a part of the Hebrew Bible, and so we believe this is inspired by God and is for our instruction and for our benefit. Job is uh, mentioned at several other places in the Bible, and so this also proves that they saw it as Scripture as well. So who's Job? Job is described in 1 verse 3 as, a, as the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was from a place called Uz. And there are some uh, historical documents that talk about Uz. Uh, very few, but there are some. He was rich and he had a lot of stuff. God also pronounces Job as a blameless an upright man. 
He was what we refer to in the Bible as a righteous man. He fears God, and it says he shuns evil. He's a good guy. Chapters 1 and 2 are the story part of the book. They describe the basis for the rest of the book. In very quick summary, we're, we're let in on a scene in the heavenly realms where Satan asks God if he may test Job's faithfulness to God by taking away physical things Job owns or loves. Satan being the accuser that he is, that's actually what that name means, he accuses God of only receiving love from his creatures because God has given them stuff. You've blessed him, of course he's going to love you. Of course he's going to be righteous. He accuses God of bribery for love. So like any other day, Job wakes up. God, God actually grants this request. So like any other day, Job wakes up, he goes about his business, but then starts to receive bad news after bad news after bad news. And like Amber Lee, Junior, and Eloy showed us, news reaches him always as he's coming to grips with the one before it. The news of his oxen, they've been stolen and his servants killed. Then another bit of news, the sheep have been burned and those servants killed as well. Then, as if things couldn't get any worse, camels stolen, servants killed. It says, uh, while they were still speaking, the news of the next one came, and the next one came, and the next one came. I feel a little bit like the beginning, and I, I know that this is, this is not a great comparison, but a little bit at the beginning of this coronavirus thing. We finally decided what we were going to do, and at, while we were still speaking, the news came back, mm-mm. Ain't going to happen. That gets overwhelming and that gets frustrating. It begins to feel maybe like the sky is falling a little bit. Well, the news came about the camels, sheep, oxen, servants. And as he was processing this, another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters, they all died. House collapsed on them. And life for Job came crashing down. Chapter 1 concludes with the statement, In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Test passed. Satan goes and accuses God again of being too nice to Job. None of this affected Job directly. Well, maybe not quite the way it is. But... God allows Satan to test Job further by giving him some physical problems. But you're not allowed to kill him. And so Job breaks out in sores and itches and pain. We don't know what the disease is. Uh, we do th know that he has a horrible condition called halitosis. Did you know that? Do you know what halitosis is? Halitosis? It's almost like it sounds. His wife it says, found his breath offensive at a different part. <laughs> I know what that's like. <laughs> I have the same problem. It is probably good that we are on the internet today for that reason. Um, it seems to have gotten worse with this coronavirus outbreak. Maybe, maybe I have uh, something worse. <laughs> but he has terrible sores and, and he itches them with, with clay and it's, it's, it's a terrible situation. What does it say at the end of chapter 2, or uh, near the end of chapter 2? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. The middle section of the book, chapters 3 through 27, is a dialogue between Job and his friends uh, that come to help him with the struggle. Uh, we're going to go through some of that in a little bit. The passage that Orlando shared with us is kind of a transition from the dialogue of the friends to Job's final monologue in chapters 29 through 31. And, that, and that's important because what Orlando read is an important thing and a, and a wise thing in our suffering. Where can wisdom 
be found? That's a good question, and that's a question that I think Job answers. Following chapter uh, 31, another uh, friend comes and gives Job a few pieces of his mind. And, and we start to see godly wisdom taking root in the book. And this is Elihu. Uh, we won't talk about Elihu. I'm going to let you read uh, what he has to say uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. And finally, after what probably felt like a lot of silence for Job from God, God speaks to him. I wonder if God was even able to speak to him uh, because of how much his friends were talking in his ear and how much he was talking. Um, but God finally speaks, and Job listens, and Job learns, and Job is convicted, and Job comes to understand what his place is in the struggle. Chapter 42, Job responds, and the story comes to completion with Job being renewed and restored and redeemed. That's the basic structure of the book. How do we possibly talk about 42 chapters this morning? I won't touch on everything, but I do want to outline some of what this book of Job is saying. Uh, Job is a very, very relevant book to us today. The questions he asks are questions we ask. Here are some of the questions that Job asks. What's the purpose of life? First thing Job questions is the purpose of life. Why life? If only I could have just died when I was born, he says. Because then at least I would be at rest. He finishes that first chapter of dialogue saying that I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. We question life itself when the world comes crashing down, don't we? Another question he asks in chapter 7 is, why does this all feel so endless? My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Day after day, the same thing. Any of you feel like that? (laughs) He thinks maybe with the morning things will get better, and he finds that they don't. Grieving people struggle with this. 7 verse 20 asks... Why have you made me your target? Why me, Lord? He also asks, why do I feel so alone in this? He often says, miserable counselors to his friends. You don't help anything. You're just rattling off all kinds of stuff. I feel alone, really. 9 verse 2 says, how can mere mortals prove their innocence? How could I prove myself to you, God, and get out of this struggle? In chapter 10, he questions his worth. Am I not precious to you anymore, God? He asks. 14 verse 5 and 6 say, Is it about just putting in time like a laborer? Do I just need to do my time? Is this necessary to get somewhere? He asks, why do the wicked prosper and I, a righteous man, suffer? Why me and not them? He asks, are you a just God? Are you fair? It doesn't look like it. These are the questions and accusations that Job brings before God. That's a real list, isn't it? That's a list that not just Job has felt. So we have the main character, Job, and the questions that he asks, the things he feels. We can relate to that. But we also have a bunch of his friends. We have Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bill's dad. I mean, Bildad. What do they say? Well, one thing on repeat for his friends is the idea that bad things don't happen to good people. Job, Job, you must have done something wrong in order to to get this type of treatment. God must be angry with you. 
Eliphaz starts out with the principle of sowing and reaping. People who sow evil reap trouble. You must have sowed some serious evil, Job. This is God's discipline on you. In the back of the reader's minds, though, as we go through this, should always be the statement that God makes in chapter 1. Job has been blameless and upright in the eyes of God. Hmm. Bildad puts this a step further. Your kids must have sinned for them to die. You get what you deserve. Your kids got what they deserved as well. Zophar says, get rid of your sin. He'll get rid of your suffering. Simple as that. Sounds like God is a put one thing in, get something in return type of a God, right? According to these friends. That's what I call vending machine theology. Put two coins in, get two blessings out. Put your check in the offering bag and then you'll get some, all kinds of good stuff. Put two good deeds in, maybe the sores will go away at least. They go from uh, God is angry at you to God doesn't really want you to just decide that you'll get past it and you'll get past it. They they have almost a name it and claim it attitude. They talk about God's justice and how that is being poured out on Job. But all of this is frustrating to Job and to us because we remember what God said about him. If even a blameless and upright man has to go through suffering then it can't be this put two coins in, get two blessings out, right? So none of these answers explain it. It doesn't explain suffering. It doesn't explain the God that he knows and he follows. None of these human reasons for suffering give Job peace and acceptance in his suffering. And maybe that is what the book is trying to teach us about suffering. Maybe the book is trying to help us shift our focus forward rather than backward. Maybe the author wants us to understand that the the suffering in our lives is not a cut and dried, one answer fits all type of a situation. Maybe the source is not the important part. Maybe looking back and trying to figure it all out just gets us frustrated and angry at God. I read a definition of faith this week. It's an interesting one. Listen to this. It's fascinating. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Let me read that again. Faith means believing in advance, so before it happens, what will only make sense if you look back on it in reverse. I think so. I think so. I've seen this at work in my life. When I've been stripped of my comfort and have experienced hardship, in the time, didn't make sense. Couldn't make sense. But looking back on it from this side, there are some important lessons I've learned from it. If I would have given up my faith that God was who he said he was, then my guess is I would look back on that suffering, that struggle, and it would be seemingly useless. But as I look back on those times in reverse, I see how he led me and how he taught me and how these times shaped me, how they were sanctifying times. Right now, We got some difficulty. Is faith going to make everything right right now? No. Is faith all that we need to get out of this? Well, maybe not for all the stuff to get removed. 
all the difficulty to get her removed. But to make it through this, sure. I think of uh, faith healing movements. You just need to have more faith and you will be well. Okay? But what does that say about the blameless and upright person who goes through difficulty and does not get healed? Just having more faith won't take away the suffering, but it will give you strength to not waste the suffering. Does that make sense? To allow God to use the suffering to mold you and shape you. I strongly believe that every difficult thing in our life, even though it makes no sense right now, will probably only make sense in reverse and probably it won't even make sense here fully. There still will be elements of it that will not make sense. And I believe that that is the message of Job. Because human reason will never be able to solve the why questions of suffering. Of course, some whys are clear, right? Why is there suffering in the world? Well, it's because man is sinful and we are not there yet. We're not to, the, to perfection yet. But the why questions that I'm talking about are more specific. They're the whys that Job asks. Why me? Or why suffering so much? Or why am I not being healed? Or was it something I did? Or why am I waiting for so long? Or why no answers? Or why do you feel so far off, God? Can I tell you something? We can try and reason it all out. But every time we try we will come up against a wall that we won't be able to climb. But what I believe Job helps us to focus on is more a question of, to what end am I suffering? In it, I'm in it. Now, what does God want to work in me through it? I can't by human reason figure out the why. Job says it many times, especially at the beginning, both the rich and the poor have the same fate. Death comes for all. He destroys both the blameless and the wicked. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount makes the statement, rain falls on both the wicked and the righteous. And so because it's not clear the why, or the answer is not found in how good I am, then I must trust in the one that who is full of strength and justice. In perhaps one of the greatest statements of trust in the book, Job says this, If all this is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if it is justice, who can challenge him? Right? If it's a matter of strength, he's, he's mighty. If it's a matter of being fair, he's completely fair. Who can challenge him? And I think that's an important, uh, it's an important statement that we can take a hold of in our suffering. If it's a matter of being mighty, amen, he's mighty. He can do it. If it's a matter of being fair, hey, there's nobody more fair than him. That is a let God be God type of a statement. And that's a statement of trust in his mightiness. But it's not this vending machine, right? I'm going to get God to do what I want him to do. No, it is saying, he will do what he wants to do. And I'm going to allow him to. Job has a few glimpses of looking far forward. Uh, one of those happens early on in chapter 9. Job has already said, uh, I'm a mere mortal. Can I really prove my innocence before God? And he comes to the conclusion, uh, well, maybe not really. Uh, he ends with a court explanation and says this. If only there were someone to mediate between us. Someone to bring us together. Hmm. A mediator? A defendant? The accuser has brought pain and suffering into my life. Now I need a defender, he says. Hmm. Interesting. In chapter 14, he states that all will go to the grave. And then he says this. If someone dies, will they live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. 
You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the creature your hands have made. You will long for the creature your hands have made. What is, what is that saying? God cares about you. So Job, you think that he doesn't care. No, Job knows he cares. Surely then you will count my steps, but not keep track of my sin. My offenses will be sealed up in a bag. You will cover over my sin. Hmm. Forgiveness. That's atonement. Washing clean, covering sins. Job doesn't make light of sinfulness. He, he, he's called righteous, but he freely admits he has done wrong. He does. He longs for the day for his renewal, and that renewal will be about forgiveness of his sin. Hmm. Chapter 19 is Job's faith believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. This is the verse that's in the bulletin. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll and engraved on a rock forever. Oh, they are, Job. (laughs) You got your wish, buddy. And that's what makes them so very good. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Hmm, what a powerful statement in the middle of extreme suffering. Even in his humanness, Job has a very real and a very strong, forward-looking faith. It's interspersed all throughout this book. When you're reading it, find those, those, those glimpses of his hope and his faith. He demands answers, sure, but we see glimpses that his response is not dependent on receiving answers because he knows that the answer will be quite a bit further in the future than he thinks. Then he's hoping. So the question, where do you go for wisdom? That chapter that Orlando read, which mind do you go for the precious metal of wisdom? Is it to your friends? Is it to Facebook? Is it to that blog that you love? That one person whose ideas are just so smart? It's not wrong to seek counsel in people. In fact, Proverbs talks about it a lot. It's good, but sometimes they are misguided. Sometimes they are rooted in human reason. And I think after reading the book of Job, the wisdom that comes from it says human reason can't explain suffering. It just can't. As much as we try to explain it, we can't. Chapters 38 to 41, God doesn't give Job the answers. But he does, what he does do is he gives Job a science lesson. Strange way of dealing with things, hey? He goes into a great deal of creation and, 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 and how he keeps it going in his wisdom. How he created it in wisdom. In essence, he's saying, how can you, Job, understand the moral universe, spirituality, suffering, my giving and my taking and my sovereignty when you can't even understand how the things you see work. (laughs) How, Job? What I found interesting, and uh, this is one of those questions that I've gotten in the past, uh, what was the Leviathan? I'm not going to explain that today, but I do find it interesting that he uses two creatures that are the mightiest of creatures, the behemoth, And the Leviathan, even just those names are just like, whoa, behemoth. You have to say it like that. When you guys are reading it, please remember that. Behemoth. Behemoth was a land creature. Seemingly the most powerful of the land creatures. And he was feared in the ancient world. God says, I made that. (laughs) 
And then he describes its power. He says, can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? In other words, I can, but can you? And Job would have said, no, that thing freaks me out. I fear that thing. I ain't getting anywhere close to that thing. God says, I, I pet that thing. That's, almost, that's kind of the, the picture that you get. Leviathan is a sea creature. Seemingly the most powerful sea creature. Some people think it's the Loch Ness monster. <laughs> Whatever the case is. Um, Leviathan was feared in the ancient world. God says, I made that. And I have control over that. You? Can you do anything with this animal? He says, nothing on earth is its equal. This is the worst of the worst. This is the biggest of the big creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is a king over all that are proud. And yet I can control that. Can you? I don't think God is being mocking here. I think he is speaking in wisdom here. I think he's putting our lives in perspective of his power. I have control over the things that you all fear. I'm above that. I'm not scared of it. Don't try to control me. Don't try to explain everything away. Human reason doesn't hold a candle to the glory of God. It's not a matter of you just being good enough. Don't, don't try to, by your finite wisdom, explain this. Don't try to find a formula for your suffering. You're not going to find the answer until you understand what I understand, God says. And so I am the only one that can actually help you through that suffering. Trust me. Trust me. If I think back to how Job looked forward and I look at where we are at today, Job gives a very good picture of the redemption that he would receive and that we receive. In Job, I do believe that we are pointed to our own redemption, our own renewal. And that renewal is at the hands of God. And really, it's the ultimate answer to suffering. And here's what I find fascinating. In the story of our redemption, at the heart of it is a story of suffering. One commentator put it this way. Old Testament characters like Job sometimes wondered aloud if God had plugged his ears to their cries of pain. Jesus put an abrupt and decisive end to such speculation. Not only had God not plugged his ears, he suddenly took on ears. Literal. Eardrum. Ossicle. Cochlea. Human ears. And Jesus put on human skin. As fragile as it was, he took on himself suffering. He was betrayed. He was beaten. His body was wrecked. He was completely overwhelmed. He wished for his suffering to be over. He felt completely alone, but he allowed the suffering to do its work. He even asked his own why question. On the cross, why, my God, have you forsaken me? Hebrews says that we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because he came and suffered. The weight of the world's pain and suffering was on him. And so, when we cry out to him in pain and suffering, he says... I know. Isn't it painful? Like Jesus looking over Jerusalem before his triumphal entry, he weeps over Jerusalem. Why? You're in for so much pain. And it breaks my heart. Like Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus, he sees the pain in Mary and Martha and he feels that pain deep in his soul. Jesus has felt suffering and pain. As much as we cannot understand the ways of God, He understands us and our suffering perfectly. 
as much as we can't get the answers to many of those suffering questions, God understands perfectly why all this happens. But it's not our business to try and figure it all out. Our job in this is to trust. Have faith that this will make sense in reverse. Our response to our suffering is to keep going. Learning, being opening, being opened to his lessons. Our response to the suffering of others is to sit and listen and grieve with them. Instead of trying to have the answers, this tells us that we don't. Instead of trying to offer up an easy answer, just sit with them. Just grieve with them. Just listen to their heart. You don't even need to respond. Except maybe with, I love you. That will show them the love of Christ in their suffering. In closing, I just want to share a short story with you about a 17th century poet named John Donne. John Donne found himself in a fair amount of suffering fairly quick. Uh, he got fired from a very good job in the field of law. Uh, he was desperate for something to keep his family alive, and so he took a position as an Anglican priest. One year into that job, his wife died and left him with his seven kids. A few years later, he was diagnosed with the bubonic plague. Sounds similar to Job. He was bedridden and nearly dead. He wrote many things during the time, really questioning God and what sense this all made. One day he was in his bed and as he was looking out the window, he heard the church bells ring. This was the custom for when someone died of the plague. The church bells would inform the rest of town. This became very important, a very important thing in his life. He thought maybe his friends, who knew actually better where, in what position he was in, rung it so that he could hear it right before he died. They had rung it for him, is what he came to believe. He did quickly realize that they were ringing it for the death of one of his neighbors, but that got him thinking. And he wrote the following about this instant... And what it taught him. It said, no man is an island. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. For John Donne, the bells served as a clear reminder of what every human being spends a lifetime trying to forget. We will all die. This bell was an advance call, according to him, of his own death. For the person that it rung for, it was the end of their lives. But for Don, Dunn, it was a different question. Am I ready to die? How then will I live? And for him, he shared with people, through his, the devotions that he wrote, he wrote a book called Devotions, and he also shared with those through his future pre preaching ministry that trials had gotten rid of sin and developed his character. Because of this event, being poor, it had really taught him dependence on God and took away his greed. He saw the pattern that was developing. His pain could be transformed, redeemed. Even the pain of the plague could end in redemption for him. I read a little bit about him, and apparently he tried to envision his soul growing strong and walking around in the room. And that gave him new hope for even being bedridden. He started to see his soul strengthening. His body was weak, but his soul was strengthening. And that gave him the strength to devote himself to more times of prayer, confession, and keeping a journal, which later became his most famous work, which has helped many people to understand the possibility of suffering, not necessarily being removed, but rather being redeemed. So Dunn came to the conclusion that we should be asking the Lord to redeem our pain. He wouldn't have said that it was wrong to pray for removing the pain. No, God sometimes does that. And he can do that. And we long for it. And that's a, that's a deep longing in our hearts. Well, not every person gets their pain removed. Every person's pain can be redeemed. It doesn't need to go to waste. And in Dunn's life, we see that going through the fire of suffering 
ended in purifying his motives, his attitudes, and his heart. God allows pain and suffering. Job teaches us that. We won't ever understand fully why he allows it. So the author of Job doesn't answer the why of suffering. But he does paint a picture of a powerful God beyond our comprehension. But he's a God who hears, who understands fully, who is willing to come to our suffering planet and redeems and guides us. Transformation that we've been reading about in, our, in the prophets is also fully at play in the book of Job. Amen.